Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Zion Hill Baptist Church. So good to see our brothers and sisters who are here with us in the sanctuary, as well as those brothers and sisters who are joining us via live stream. Uh, we're glad that you have come to share with us in our Bible for Life for this evening. And we are hoping and praying that God will bring to you uh, a message that will encourage, that will enlighten, maybe for some a message that will calm and console. We're going to ask now if Deacon Willie Austin would lead us in prayer. Good evening. Father God, let us pray. Father God, thank you for allowing us to see another day. Thank you for all the things that you continue to do for us. Thank you for another opportunity to learn and to do thus saith the Lord. We ask that you forgive us because we often sin and fall short of the mark. But since you're forgiving God, we ask that you forgive us and forgive the others who trespassed against us. Father, we just ask that you bless our church continually and to help our sick and shut-in members who can't be with us. There are some who are suffering from different types of illnesses. They might be mental illnesses, physical illness, or even spiritual illnesses. We ask for a healing, Father God, because we know that you are able. We ask that you do it for them because you've done it for some of us. Unfortunately, Father, there are some of us who in our city, our state, our country, and our world who have turned away from you. It seems that we often talk like Jesus, but we act like Satan. It's very confusing. So we ask that you turn us around, Father God. Revive us again, Father God. You've done it for many of us, Father God. You've done it for me personally, Father God, and I just ask that you do it for our world. Finally, Father God, we thank you for our pastor and for his ministry of love and service and for blessing Zion Hill to serve others inside and outside the walls of this church. I submit this prayer in the name of Jesus to Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Deacon Austin. But brothers and sisters, there are just a few community and congregational concerns that we want to uh, simply remind you of. Uh, certainly, we continue our fight against COVID-19. Uh, here at Zion Hill, we are still offering testing on Thursdays and vaccinations and boosters on Tuesdays. Uh, please check your announcements for uh, details, but if you have not yet, gotten your vaccinations. I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, that COVID is actually still with us. We are talking to brothers and sisters every day who are coming down with COVID. And if you have your vaccinations and your boosters, then the disease is usually much milder. So we urge each and every one of you to certainly get those vaccinations. And if you need testing, once again, testing is on Thursdays. Uh, the Zion Hill uh, Educational Aid Committee uh, is uh, preparing to uh, award the uh, Larry H. Williams uh, Educational Fund Scholarships. Uh, the deadline for getting in your applications is Monday, June the 27th. So we want to say to all of our young people who are eligible to apply for this scholarship to please do so before Monday, June the 27th. Uh, we uh, continue with our 150th church anniversary celebration on this, uh, this month, uh, this month of June. My brothers and sisters, we have some very exciting and uplifting events that are going to happen during this month of June. First of all, have you heard me say before, 
we are going to have still learning, still learning, uh, adult classes uh, in the uh, master class format. And we have three outstanding facilitators who are coming to share with us. Uh, first, on that Wednesday evening, June the 8th, we will have the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown of Candler School of Theology at Emory University. She will be coming and sharing with us uh, from the general topic of faith and social justice, but more specifically, she will be dealing with the topic more than political correctness, more than political correctness. Uh, then on Thursday, June the 9th, uh, the Reverend Dr. Wallace C. Baxter III will come and share with us. He is the uh, eminent pastor of the Second Baptist Church, uh, southwest of District Heights, Maryland. He's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. He will come and talk about the sin of white supremacy, the sin of white supremacy. And then uh, the Reverend Timothy McDonald III, a pastor of the First Iconium Baptist Church here in Atlanta, and a veteran, a veteran human and civil rights leader uh, will come and talk to us about the politics of our faith. So we're looking for you to come and join uh, all adults. Please do so. We also have classes for our youth and children. There are classes for our youth and children. And I want to make this as clear as possible. Our, our youth and children are really going to be dealing with questions of identity. Ask the question, well, who am I? Yeah, I know, you know, you're your mama and your daddy's child, but, but who else are you? What are the things that you like? What are the things that you don't like? Why do you like certain things and don't like other things? How do you relate to other people? Those are going to be some of the questions that we're going to be dealing with with um, our youth and children. Uh, don't forget our youth will have a special treat because some of our college students will come and talk to our teens about their life experience changes. And we're looking forward to uh, that, my brothers and sisters. So again, that is uh, Still Learning, June the 8th, 9th, and 10th. Dinner will be served each of those three evenings, beginning at 5.30, and dinner will close at 6.45 so that we can all be in our classes by 7 p.m. That's where we are, my brothers and sisters, and we're looking forward to each of you. Now, let me say just a little something about this. Uh, on that Saturday, which will be June the 11th, we're just going to come out here and have a good time. We're going to have activities outside, all kinds of activities. We're going to be doing some sports. There will be games. There will be all kinds of uh, different rides as well right here on the campus. So you don't want to miss that, brothers and sisters. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a great time. It is actually, now some of you may have been here before and you've seen how it happened. Let me tell you something. It's bigger and better this time. So you do not want to miss it. Fun for the entire family. There will be plenty of food to eat uh, and a lot of uh, games and activities that will take place, and this will primarily be outside, of course, weather permitting. Now, let me say this, because this is a, an important piece of this. If you have not yet registered for these activities, still learning and still play, brothers and sisters, you need to take your phone out. If you're on your computer, go to your computer and register, register. You need to register so that we can have an accurate count of how many people we need to prepare for. So please, brothers and sisters, go and register. Go and register. Now, if for some reason you are extraordinarily challenged when it comes to technology, I mean, you don't even have a cell phone. Now, you don't have a cell phone, we understand. We understand then you go to your rotary dial phone. Chick, that one that you just turn around. You go to your, and you dial the church's number. And you call the church office and you tell the church office, I need to register. 
and you can get registered that way. Now that's the simplest form of registration that we can have, brothers and sisters. So there is no excuse for anyone not registered. Register, come out and share, come out and engage these speakers. Then come out and have a great time in the Lord. This is a time of celebration. We are thanking God for what God has done for us down through these years and how God continues to bless us even now. And so brothers and sisters, come and join and share. This is a time where we can be together and share together as much as we possibly can. God bless you and God keep you. This is our prayer. And now, uh, Sister Rosalind Watley Lumpkin will come and share with us in song.
Lord, somebody. Praise the Lord, somebody. Is God faithful tonight? Is God faithful today? Has, has God been there for you when no one else was there for you? Great is God's faithfulness. Ah, praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Sister Watley, you got us off to a great start tonight. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Ah. We still have something left. That's what we're talking about tonight. We still have something left. As we continue our Bible for Life series that is entitled Still Here, Still Here. We still have something left, something left. Uh, I, I want to uh, lift up tonight a rather remote passage of scripture that's found in 2 Kings uh, chapter 42, chapter 4, verse 42 through 44. And this is the way that scripture reads in the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, a man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God. Twenty loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat for thus says the Lord. They shall eat and have some left. <laughs> he said it before them, they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. Uh, again, our, our, our organizing thought tonight is we still have something left. Let's proceed into the uh, introduction to this lesson, brothers and sisters. At times, the fear of running short can become quite critical. For many in today's world, the fear uh, centers on financial resources, which are required in supplying virtually all of the physical needs of life. We, we know how problematic this is, my brothers and sisters, in attempting to uh, acquire, maintain, uh, uphold, keep going. And, and I would imagine that the vast majority of people in life have at some point run short on material resources. And I want you to try to remember that feeling, that feeling of running short on material resources. Do you remember how you felt wondering how you're going to make it? Now, I know there are a few of you who have never, ever, 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 ever had that experience. God bless you. God keep you. I always expect those people who have never had an experience like that to be the first people to stand up and shout when somebody says God is good. You know why? Because you haven't had any experience of hardship in your life. No physical hardship whatsoever. But for the rest of us who have gone through that experience, we know how unsettling life can be in situations like that. And, and I know some of us, are, you know, we call ourselves believers. But let me tell you something. When, when, when those bills keep coming, and they keep coming, and the money stops, or the money runs low. Some of the best of us get a little uneasy. So this whole notion and idea of, of that there is a real fear of running short. Here we go. Uh, for others, the fear of scarcity or lack focuses on intangibles, such as friendship, companionship, love, will, our will, our drive, our emotional stamina, and and things of this sort. In other words, brothers and sisters, sometimes it's, it's not a lack of physical things that we fear, but rather it is a lack of emotional, psychological, I would dare say even spiritual things that we lack. Sometimes we fear that we just can't go on. I'm talking about 
when you get attacked by depression, stress, distress, things like bereavement. These are all these intent, but, but they are all fears, my brothers and sisters, that we lack something, that there's something we don't have in order to continue a, a life of well-being. We have these fears. We go. Hence, the fear of running short is actually a fear of inconvenience. That's when it's kind of mild. There is also a fear of suffering. And in some cases, our fears are fears of annihilation. In other words, we actually fear that we will be destroyed. And let me now talk about the kinds of fears that are being created by some of the latest news reports, the latest events that have been happening in this nation. There is a, a, a kind of unsettling, disturbing fear. And, and I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but, 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 but there is some concern. I have some concern about how far we are going to go before we make some serious moves regarding some obvious problems that we have. I'll give you just one example. Right now, one of the things that's uppermost in our minds has been the recent school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. The question that bothers me, and it continues to bother me, is when are we going to do whatever we can in order to try to stop it? How, how long is, and watch this very carefully, is the fear of losing some money going to outweigh the protection of our children? We know what it's about. There are some people who are making a lot of money and they, it's not that they fear going broke. They just fear not making, you know, well, what? Instead of a $500 million profit, they'll make $400 million worth of profit. I think they can still live on that, don't you? I think they can still live on that, but, but, but they don't want to give any of it up. And all they have to do is to do something. Now, it's not certain that moving in certain directions will actually protect our children. We don't know. But one thing we do know, one thing we do know, you cannot kill as many people with a regular handgun as you can with an automatic assault weapon. Why do people have them? I'm going on record right now. Whoever's listening, doesn't matter. Record right now. Those assault weapons need to be absolutely, completely, 100% banned Nobody has any business. No one has any business with a weapon that was made for war walking up and down the street and where they can take that weapon, walk into a school. And you, nobody has, no one has any business with a weapon like that. We just don't. So, but all of that is out of fear of losing Profit. We got these fears. These, these, these fears are short. Let, let's press on. Let's press on here. This chosen biblical narrative reports a miraculous meal that we often overlook in the scriptures. Uh, most of us are familiar with other miraculous meals that happen in scripture. And here are some of these uh, miraculous meals. Let me just uh, lift up maybe a couple of them. Uh, most people probably know more about the uh, astonishing feeding of the Israelites during their desert wanderings after they left Egypt start wandering in the desert. They, they started com to complain to Moses. Moses, you know, you brought us out here in this desert in order to starve to death. And then God told Moses, you know what, Moses, I'm going to rain down some manna from when I, God rains down manna, this kind of peculiar wafer-like substance that comes down and sort of collects on trees early in the morning. Uh, they use that for bread. And then after they had bread for a while, they started complaining, well, we just eating bread. Can we have some meat? Can't satisfy some people, right? Uh, but uh, God said, all right, I'm going to give you some meat too. So God sent quail in abundance. Okay. 
Uh, most of us also are familiar with uh, the uh, two great banquets that uh, Jesus had when he uh, fed over 5,000 uh, at one of them and over 4,000 uh, at another with just a few fish and some loaves of bread. We, we know about those feedings. Um, uh, but here, brothers and sisters, we have a story of a wonder meal that took place in the presence of the prophet Elisha. Once again, this is one of these meals that we're going to talk about, a miraculous meal. As a matter of fact, I would even submit, brothers and sisters, that this particular meal actually sets the groundwork and the foundation for the meals that Jesus had when he fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. Because Elisha, of course, is uh, somewhere around 800 years before the time of Jesus. And so this miracle that Elijah performs is an extraordinary miracle. Okay. But let's review a little bit about Elisha. Uh, first of all, his name means God is salvation. God is salvation a combination of, uh, of, of two terms there. Uh, he was the uh, son of uh, Shaphat. He lived in the Jordan River Valley. He belonged to a family of material means. In other words, uh, Elisha probably had a little money. And people say, well, how do you know Elisha had some money? Well, brothers and sisters, when Elisha was called to be a prophet, his predecessor, Elijah, found him plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. Now you got to understand, everybody didn't own 12 yoke of oxen. That was something extraordinary. That means that Elisha, oh, listen to this now, obviously had something to give up when he was called to be a prophet. Because it is said that he actually left those animals, he actually slayed those, and he left the farm. He left the rich farm that he was on. Okay. So he belonged to this family of material means. God also appointed him to become the successor of the cultic prophet leader, Elijah. Make sure you get those two distinct, uh, distinct, uh, distinctive uh, persons here. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is the older of the two. He is the first leader of the cultic prophets. Elijah with the J is the prototype of all of the ancient Hebrew prophets. He is the one who is especially uh, seen as the prophet who goes before the powers that be. Uh, some people say, well, Moses was a prophet before him, and in a sense, Moses was. Uh, but Moses almost belongs, he's sort of one of those pivotal figures that in part belongs to the period of the ancestors, Moses does. Uh, and he sort of kind of moves over to the prophet. He's sort of a, 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 a bridge kind of person. Uh, and and, and that's, that, that's what you have with, uh, with, with Moses. But uh, Elijah is the prophet. Moses is understood more as a leader, as a liberation leader. Elijah, the prophet, the one who receives the word from God and goes and tells uh, the, uh, the powers that be, those who are ruling, look, things are going to change. Well, Elisha, the S-H-A, is the one who comes after him. He is his successor. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Elijah told him, uh, Elisha said, uh, he said to Elijah, you know what, what I want, what I want is a double portion of your spirit. In other words, Elijah, whatever you got, I want it double. What, 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 whatever you're doing, I want it double. And of course, that was granted to him when Elijah, with the J, uh, the Bible says he was caught up in a like a whirlwind of fire, and he was carried off into Kevin in this whirlwind of fire. Here we go. Elisha, unlike Elijah, although Elijah did some miracles too, but Elisha is most widely known for the many miracles that God wrought through him. As a matter of fact, and this is a piece, brothers and sisters, that some people uh, don't understand. Uh, Elisha, in all of the Bible, Elisha is the, uh, he has the third most miracles 
recorded in the Bible. Elisha has the third most miracles recorded in the Bible. Number one, of course, is Jesus. He has about 43. Then after Jesus, it's Moses, who has about 38. Elisha comes in third at about 15 to 16 miracles that are recorded. So Elisha is known as a miracle worker, as a miracle worker. Okay, here we go. See if we can get, get, get along here. Uh, the miracle we have lifted up today uh, is one of his lesser known miracles. Uh, it teaches us, because uh, Elisha actually uh, performed a number of other miracles that are much more well known. Uh, probably the most, well, one of the most well known miracles that he performed was the uh, healing of Naaman, uh, who was um, an Armenian general. Uh, he got leprosy, and he, uh, one of his uh, servant girls told him that there is a prophet in Israel who can heal people. And uh, uh, Naaman went to uh, Elisha's house, and Elisha wouldn't even come to the door to see him. And uh, one of Elisha's servants said, that, that, hey, there's this uh, Armenian general out here to see you. He said, what's wrong with him? He said, he's got leprosy. He said, told him, go dip in the Jordan seven times. Uh, I, I, I often uh, see that. I, I, I said, uh, I don't know. I used to say that Elisha was, uh, was probably playing cards or something, and he just didn't feel like getting up. Or maybe he was watching his favorite movie. I don't know what he was doing, but, but he didn't get up to go see the general. general. He said, go watch seven times. Of course, Naaman got mad. He said, well, my goodness. Now, he was from Syria. He said, there are all these uh, uh, clear and clean rivers in Syria that I could go and bathe in. Uh, why didn't you tell me to go and wash in that old dirty Jordan? And then one of the little servant girls say, well, you know, why don't you just try it? Of course, Naaman eventually went and tried it. He dipped in the Jordan seven times and he came up uh, cleansed. That, that's probably his, his most well-known miracle. And he did some other things. He, called, he caused a metal, axe handle, a, a metal axe head to float on top of the water. He, uh, he, uh, uh, he cleaned up some poison water. He uh, made, did some with some messed up stew. He did a lot of things. He did a whole lot of things. That, that was some oil that a, that, that, that a woman had that uh, she, owed, uh, she owed some money and, and some people wanted to take her children into slavery because uh, she owed the money. Uh, but Elisha was Abe told her to go and tell your children to go and gather all the vessels that they can. And Elisha started pouring oil. And as they poured oil, they kept pouring oil and kept pouring oil and kept out of this one little vessel. And all these vessels got filled up. And you know what? The oil didn't stop running until they couldn't find any more vessels. I'm going to tell you something about shortages in just a minute. Uh, they they could, could not, so they ran out of space before God ran out of miracle. All right? <laughs> all right, so the, those are his more well-known men. This one is not very well-known, but we want to lift it up because it actually helps us to understand this concept of uh, still having something left. Let's press on. As we move into the uh, very heart of, we want to talk first uh, about this notion idea, and that is the gift of first fruits. Uh, it, it, it is said that this unnamed man, Go, go, go out here. This, this unnamed man, this unnamed man brought his first fruits to Elisha. The idea of first fruits, brothers and sisters, a fairly common idea in the ancient world of the Near East, involved presenting the first of one's ripened crops before a deity in gratitude for and anticipation of an abundant crop. In other words, people recognized and acknowledged that a deity had given them this crop and so they took their first, the first of their harvest and presented it to a deity. Now, this is not something that was only practiced by the Israelites. This was actually practiced by other people who lived around the Israelites as well. In other words, it was a very common practice. The Israelites probably adopted it from people who lived around them. 
Okay, here we go. The same idea was carried over into uh, raising, the raising of domestic animals as well, wherein shepherds brought the firstborn of their flock as a sacrifice to their God. Here's some examples of first fruits that we find in the Bible. Uh, many of us will remember that uh, Abel, the uh, second, uh, he's actually the second son uh, of uh, Adam and Eve, uh, he gave the firstlings of his flock. Uh, it was accepted by God. His brother Cain's uh, offering was not accepted by God. Uh, that is because uh, Abel brought the firstlings, his first, his first. Keep that in mind. That's very critical. Uh, the Israelites then were instructed to uh, bring the choices of the first fruits of their ground uh, into the house of God. That is, that instruction was given in Exodus 23. Uh, then the uh, prophet Jeremiah uh, identified Israel as the first fruits of God's harvest, the first fruits of God's harvest. In other words, uh, as the chosen ones of God. Uh, then you have the Apostle Paul employing the concept figuratively. He talks about the first fruits of the Spirit in Romans 8 and 23. And Christ as the first fruits of those who have died. And there he's speaking primarily of Christ's re resurrection as the first fruit, the resurrection as a kind of uh, as a kind of a bearing of fruit of new life, as it were. So Christ is the first fruits of those who have died. Then in the book of Revelation, the uh, symbolic 144,000 uh, constitute the initially saved are called the first fruits of God and the Lamb. Who are that 144,000? Those are the uh, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They are, you say, well, what about, what is this? Well, only a, you always hear people ask questions like, well, will only 144,000 people be saved in the end? That's not what the text says. These are just the first fruits. The text actually speaks of a number that no one can number from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue. That's who will be saved. That's in Revelation. Here we go. The notion of first fruits, therefore, brothers and sisters, has to do with giving honor and glory to God for what God has done and for what God will do. It is to recognize God as primary, the most important. God is pivotal and fundamental in all of life. Uh, the notion of first fruits illustrates the uh, acceptance of God as uh, ultimate concern. Uh, the uh, mid 20th century theologian Paul Tillich uh, talked about God as being ultimate concern, ultimate concern. In other words, that about which you are mostly concerned, that which takes first place in your life, that to which nothing else, that to which nothing else can take its place. God is number one. Is God number one in your life? That's the big question that we are pressing here. My brothers and sisters, I'm coming to this idea of shortage in just a moment. There are biblical passages that emphasize God as first. The first of the Ten Commandments says, you shall have no other gods before or besides me. Exodus 20 and 3. Jesus' instruction on not worrying said this, seek first the kingdom of God. And understand, brothers and sisters, because this is really about shortage, shortages too. Jesus was actually trying to calm people down about worrying over stuff. Just worry, worry, worry. Can you just think about how much joy, how much peace, how much meaningful interaction worry has stolen from each of our lives? Worry is a thief, and it will snatch your joy away from you. And who can change anything by worry? Uh, th that was um, one, uh, one writer said, uh, worry uh, does not help with the problems of tomorrow. He said, it only robs you of your joy today. 
We worry over things that might happen. And in the process, we not only destroy tomorrow, we mess up today at the same time. Jesus says, stop worrying. But do what? Seek first. You see kingdom of God. And sometimes, you know, people have these portraits of kingdoms, you know, where somebody is dressed all in regal. That, that, that's not the main thrust of, of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is anywhere God is in control. That's what the kingdom of God is. Sometimes people think of the kingdom of God as being in heaven. But the kingdom of God is actually anywhere that somebody is in, that God is in control. So if God is in control in your mind, brothers and sisters, then there is the kingdom of God. If God is in control in your household, there is the kingdom of God. If God is in control in your school, there is the kingdom of God. Wherever God is in control, that is the kingdom. So what Jesus was saying here is this. Seek to put God in control. If you let God have control, if you let God uh, order the day, if you let God set the agenda, uh, put together the plans, if you let God do it, then everything else you need will be added to you. I know that sounds utterly and completely preposterous to those of us who live in this postmodern uh, hyper technological world that if you put God first then the things that you need for this life will be added to you will be given to you see God and God's righteousness now notice that this is not just a matter of of thinking about God or of declaring that God, but you actually have to seek God's righteousness. You know what that means? That means that you are seeking to do the will of God. And it is in seeking to do the will of God that these things are added to you. The will of God, I never told anybody to be lazy. <laughs> never, ever, ever. The will of God never tells anybody to be lazy. As a matter of fact, Jesus had a real problem with lazy folks. As a matter of fact, in one story, Jesus actually says that lazy folk going to end up condemned. Y'all remember the story of the talents? The one with five, the one with two, the one with one, one with five. Multiplied his. Well done, good and faithful servant. One with two, multiplied his. He had four. He said, well done, good and faithful. The one with one did what? He hid it. He buried it. And and, and, and listen at what, how the master responded to him. He said, you wicked and slothful or lazy servant. Wickedness and laziness were juxtaposed. They were put right together. What am I saying here? You put God first. You seek God's and God's will in your life. Then the things you need will be added to you. All right, let's press on. Here's another one. Now let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. Then in uh, Psalm 62, we find God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Practically, my brothers and sisters, this means giving God our best time, our best talent, and material resources. For when we do that, when we make God first, when we actually put God first in our operations, in our lives, God takes care of Brothers and sisters, I just... It is absolutely, positively amazing. Now, it doesn't always come in money, but sometimes it does come in money. Uh, I'm going to tell you the story. I, I, was in, I was in line uh, last week. I was in line last week uh, trying to get some food. You know, where you go through the line and order your food online. I was in line. And uh, I got my food and I paid for it. 
And then I, I stepped back and I was waiting for something else to come. And right behind me was a, uh, was a young lady, very young lady. She had, a, she had a child, maybe who was about three years old. She had another one, a little baby in her arms. And uh, the Holy Spirit just said, pay for her food. I had no idea who she was. She was probably young enough to be my granddaughter, certainly, because she was younger than my children. Um, but some just said, pay for it. I paid for it. That was on a Saturday. You know what happened the next day? I guess it was, I mean, it was for all of them, so the very next day, the very next day, somebody gave me $900. The very next day. Now, I know some people say, well, there's no direct correlation between that. You know, there's no direct correlation between it. Okay, let, let me put it this way. I know I cannot prove a direct correlation between the two. I understand that I cannot do that. But what I do know is this. When you open up your heart and your mind to the spirit, God takes care of your needs. That's what I have tried over and over and over. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've tried it. And I've not only tried it, brothers and sisters, on a personal level, we here at Zion Hill have tried it on a church level where we are constantly giving and giving and helping people and trying to help. Sometimes people we barely know and don't even know at all, but just give. And, and, and God has blessed us as a church all down through these years. It's been, those of you who are sitting in here know exactly what I'm talking about. God has blessed us tremendously as a congregation. All right, I'm coming to this a little bit later. Let's, let's, let's press on, let's press on. Uh, su such recognition of the benefactor opens the door for a continued flow of benefits. In other words, when we recognize the benefactor, that's how you keep the benefits flowing. When you get tied up in the benefits <laughs> and you ignore the benefactor, then you start to get scared because you think that because the benefits are only here for a moment. The benefits are transitory. They don't last. That's what Jesus was talking about when he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and dust corrupt and where thieves break in and steal. Rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor dust corrupt and where thieves cannot break in and steal. If you build your hopes on things eternal, God will take care of this stuff down here. That, 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 that's, that's what we're saying. Make, make, make sure that you focus on the benefactor and don't become preoccupied with the benefits. Here we go. Hence, acknowledging God as first fruits becomes one of the main directives in showing us how we can still <laughs> have something. The way you have something left, brothers and sisters, is that you acknowledge that God is first. All right, here we go. Let's move fast. Uh, the gift then was given to the people. This is what the uh, text says. After, after, after the man brought the gift, Elisha says to this man, this unnamed man, he said, give these first fruits that you bought and this bread that you bought, give it to the people and let them eat. Now, that seems like something very simple. The offering was brought to Elijah, the man of God, but he ordered this servant to give the food to the people. Elisha could have kept it all for himself because it was brought to him and let me say to uh, some of our brothers and sisters in the clergy who constantly and consistently try to line their pockets with God's money uh, <laughs> I, there was an old expression and, and uh, there was a book written about it 
as a matter of fact, by one of our, uh, one of our speakers, uh, Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, and the title of the book was God Don't Like Ugly. <laughs> God Don't Like Ugly! And that eventually catches up with you. One way, be not deceived, Paul said. God is not mocked, M-O-C-K-E-D. In other words, you can't fool God, you can't trick God, you can't <laughs> put one over on God. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that shall that person also reap. All right, but, 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 but Elisha said, give the food to the people. Here we go. Of course, the amount of the food did not seem sufficient in order to satisfy a group, uh, this particular group, because Elisha's servant complained, how can I set this before a hundred people? Now, we don't know exactly who this hundred people are. Some people say that the hundred people were uh, a part of that, the group of prophets that Elisha was about, but it does not say that in the text. It could have just been another random group of people. Be that as it may, uh, Elijah says, "Put it, give it to the people to eat. This man says, well, I already know that this is not enough for all those people. Why? Because he was operating in a purely and exclusively natural world. When one operates purely and exclusively in a natural world, it will always seem like you're short. <laughs> it always seems like that's the reason that super rich people, some of them, can never get enough. Stop and think about that. Because they're operating in a purely natural, and when you fit, and the reason you think you can't get enough it's because you think that somehow you're going to lose it. You, so you got to get more and get more and get more. And you say, well, man, well, well, when, well, when is enough? Enough. And I think sometimes, brothers and sisters, it's, it's not until some of our, our super rich brothers and sisters get along in life and uh, realize that they got to go the way that every other human being had to go. And what you will see among some is that they start giving it away. Trying to get right with who or whatever they think is God. Because they come to the hard and hardcore realization, you know what? I can't take it with me. <laughs> so I might as well try to do some good with it. Okay, so here we go. Elisha's servant complains, saying, how can I set this before 100 people? Uh, I, I, how do we still have something left, my brothers and sisters? It's very simple, by sharing with others. This is another, we put God first, that's number one, and then number two is we share what we have with others. Uh, the ethic of liberal individualism has so deeply permeated the psyches of blacks black people of all classes that we have little support for a political ethic of communalism that promotes the sharing of resources. And the renowned uh, black feminist Bell Hook, Hooks, who just passed away uh, this past year, we have become so enamored with ourselves. We have become so isolated as human beings, so, so separated from others that, 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 that we can no longer even fathom the idea of sharing resources. The question becomes, why is anybody in the world starving today? Why would anybody in the world be starving today? The only explanation is that we are so consumed and caught up in a, uh, an individualistic philosophy of life that we are not capable of understanding I need to share.
There are scriptural foundations everywhere for the whole notion idea of sharing. Uh, Jesus said, but when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And some translations say reward you openly. In other words, God will let other folk know that you have done the right thing. Okay, sharing, sharing, sharing. Uh, in all of this, I, I have given you an example that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. For he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's one of those expressions that people have sort of, you know, ripped out of the context and they sort of just sort of say it, where it's more blessed to give than to receive. But when you step back, brothers and sisters, and actually analyze what that, what that means, what that means is that you've already experienced the goodness of God. You already know what God can do in your life because you are acutely aware of what God can do. You give. Your, your, your giving is actually a sign that you recognize that you've been blessed. Your giving becomes an indication of the blessing that God has already bestowed upon you. And you know what happens? That giving actually becomes a funnel through which additional blessings come. That's why the one who gives is more blessed than the one who receives because the one who receives just has what? What they got. But the one who gives, my brothers and sisters, not only have, they not only have what they have, they also have what is coming back to them in return. Okay. Two of the clearest indications that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us is to display the Holy Spirit, uh, the spiritual fruit of kindness and generosity. Among those uh, uh, spiritual fruits, we find kindness and generosity. In other words, kindness and generosity, brothers and sisters, is not something that you, it's not something that you can fake. I, I mean, you can put on a show, it'll look like you can, but you know a person is truly kind and, gen and generous when, when their generosity just kind of flows out of them. In other words, it's a kind of natural activity. And let me tell you something, and I'm, I'm going to push this a little further. I don't think there are too many kind people, genuinely and authentically kind people in the world. I'm talking about people who do it like secondhand. It's just natural for them to do it. I don't think there are too many people. You know why? Because we're caught up in what Bell Hooks was saying, that kind of radical individualism, and we're so concerned about ourselves that we are afraid, listen to this, we are afraid to really care about somebody because we think we won't have enough. Again, it's that fear of shortage. We think that we don't, won't have enough. But I've never, ever, 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 ever in my life seen somebody who was naturally generous and kind who lacked. I know some people say, nah, you don't, you're not. That, that, that's not true. Let, 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 me, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Even if that person does not have a lot, physically. That's what I'm trying to show you. Even if the person doesn't have a lot physically, what they have is the confidence that God will take care of me. If I do the will of God, somehow, some way, God is going to make Away. And when you walk in that confidence, you've already won. You already have the victory. Why do you have the victory? You've got the victory over worry. You've got the victory over fear. You've got the victory over stress. You've got the victory over distress. You've got victory over anxiety. You've got the victory. You already have the victory. And nothing can get in your life and mess you up. So folk can come and take your stuff. Yeah, you want to get your stuff back, but brothers and sisters, you don't lose your mind because your stuff is gone. 
Don't, don't tie your mind up so much with your stuff that when somebody takes your stuff, they also take your mind. Naturally kind and generous. Here we go. Each of you, Paul said, must give as you have made up in your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what kind of giver? A cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. What in the world was the Apostle Paul saying to the believers at Corinth? He was saying this, God just does not want you to give. God says you need to give cheerfully. Isn't it a peculiar thing? I, I don't know about you, but I really don't want stuff that people give reluctantly and begrudging. I, I'd rather just keep your stuff. Keep, keep your stuff. Don't. In other words, I, I'm not so happy about the stuff as I am about what kind of relationship motivated the giving of the stuff. If the motivation for the giving is self-centered, conniving, underhanded, you trying to manipulate by giving, you keep your stuff. Hold your stuff. I don't well, God is kind of like that, brothers and sisters. God loves a cheerful giver. So don't think that just because you write a big check to the church that you have done what God requires. Writing a big check is actually not it. It is the spirit with which you write that check. That is what makes a difference to God. You know, you know how God is. God does not look on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. That's what God looks at. God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide all you need in abundance. Let's press. All right. True giving, righteous giving, giving from the heart because you seek to do good always comes back in ways and quantities, listen at this, more abundant than in your giving. When you give right, when you give righteously, what you get in return is always more than what you gave. And you need to understand why it's more than what you gave. The reason it's more than what you gave is because when you give it, you weren't looking for anything in return so that if you get anything back, you're just as happy, you're just so happy that you don't know what to do. Why are you so happy? You're so happy because you weren't looking for anything to come back. And so when something does come back, you are just as elated and overjoyed as you can be. Why? Because this is something that I wasn't expecting. You know how it is when you get something you don't expect. You know the kind of joy, how it just makes you feel and you're just as happy as you, you can be, my brothers. Well, that's the, that's the way God sends our blessings back to us. Here we go. What one receives from giving is not always tangible, however but it is always abundant, always a blessing, always a bounty, always more than enough, and hence it is enough to share. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when we share, y'all need to hear this, we always have something left. <laughs> because when you give it out, God is going to make sure that something else is still there. Oh, y'all remember that story? I told you this story last week. We, 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 uh, that, 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 
That, that woman gave her last meal and her last oil to the prophet that came before Elisha, Elijah. Gave her last. She poured out her last. She poured, and the more she poured, the more she had. Y'all don't understand what I'm saying. The more she gave, the more she had. The, okay, all right, we, we, we got to press on. We got to press on. We, we, we have something left, brothers and sisters, when we share with others. Thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have something left. Uh, Elisha was pronouncing the word of the Lord. He said, go on and put that food out in front of these people. Don't worry about how much it is right now. You know why? Because God is getting ready to take it and change it and transform it and make it not only what it, not only make it sufficient, but make it more than sufficient. They're going to have something left. This is a message, brothers and sisters, about trusting in God regardless, regardless of the situation, regardless of how much is there. Psalm 37 and 3 says, in the New Living Translation, trust in the Lord and do good, then you will live safely in the land and prosper. In the New Jerusalem, that's the NJB, the New Jerusalem Bible says this, put your trust in Yahweh and do right. Make your home in the land and live secure. And so we come with this conclusion, my brothers and sisters. The way to have something left is to put our trust in the one who always has everything. <laughs> you see, if you give away all your things and you're still in God, you still have all you need. The earth is the Lord's. The fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. Here's the last statement here. You know, in order for something to grow, you really got to give it away. Nothing can grow if you're just holding on to it. Your money can't grow. unless you let it go in some kind of investment. A seed can't grow unless you turn it loose and let the ground have it. Your children can't grow unless one day you let them make decisions on their own. In order for anything to grow, you got to let it. This is what I believe God is telling us about how we deal with the shortages in our lives. Don't fret. Stop worrying. Stop allowing your life to get all tied up in knots because you don't have this and you can't get here. Calm down. Trust in God. Do what is required to get where you need to go. The more you worry, the less efficient you will be. Calm it down. Talk to God. More importantly, let God speak to you. Let me tell you something. It will calm your nerves. Open up some doors that you could not see because you were in a fog of worry. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, Every time you get ready to do something, you're going to school, acknowledge God. You're going to work, acknowledge God. You're trying to get married, acknowledge God. You get ready to retire, acknowledge God. You're trying to make a decision about where you're going to go on a trip, acknowledge God. In all thy ways, acknowledge God. And God will direct your path. My brothers and sisters, we are grateful to God that you've decided to share with us on this evening. We hope that something has been said or done that will inspire you along the way. 
we want to extend now the invitation to the Christian family. If you are here tonight, if you're here tonight, and you want to give God your life, you want this relationship with God, you, you want to experience the calmness of God. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, this is not something I'm just blowing smoke about. I have prayed to God for years. Lord, just keep me calm in your spirit. But life is going to happen. In other words, you're going to have some ups, some downs, some ins, some outs. It's going to get tough sometimes. Times are going to be lean sometimes. And I've learned that that's just the way life is going to be. It's just going to be that way. So I have been praying and asking for years now. God, just give me peace. That's, that's, that, I know these things are going to come. They're going to come and they're going to go. People are going to come and go. Even people you love are going to come and go. But God just if you want this peace of God that the Apostle Paul says surpasses all understanding we invite you to give your life to God tonight if that is the case and you're here I want to invite you to come down front if you're listening to us via live stream I want to ask that you would give us a call or send us a note and you can do it to this telephone number and this email address at 404-844-4282 that's 404-844-4282 or send us the note the email to zhbc at zionhill.org and you don't have to say a whole lot just say I am ready to establish this relationship with God that's all you need that's all you need we will make contact with you a little bit later on and have some conversation with you to let you know what next steps you need to take. Right now, this is the time for coming.
Praise God. Praise God. God will indeed take care of you. Again, my brothers and sisters, we thank you for coming and for sharing with us on this evening. We hope and pray that something has been done or said that will inspire you along the way. We ask that you would please remember that as long as you have God, you still have something left. God bless you and God keep you. This is our prayer. of you.